Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this Ask the Expert session. Today, we're going to look at ChatGPT and the technology behind it. Um, unfortunately, one of our experts, David, cannot join us today as he's unwell, um, but we do have Matteo here with us today. And um, so he'll be giving you um, a run through some slides that talk about ChatGPT, and then we're going to get a chance to have a bit of a game at the end. So my name is Katrina Bray. I'm one of the communications managers for the faculty of STEM. And you'll see me again once it's time for that game. We'll be using VBox. So I'll pop the link to that in the chat. If at any time you've got questions or want to contribute comments, Pop those in the chat on either Facebook or YouTube, and I will pick them up and uh, pass them over to Matteo. So Matteo is the lead developer for open research at CORE, which I'm sure he'll explain what that stands for. And he also works with David, who can join us today at the Knowledge Media Institute in the Faculty of STEM at the OU. Right, Matteo, over to you now. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, yes, uh, thank you, Katrina, for the PO. Like you, you stole my first 10 seconds of presentation. So now I can go straight into the uh, the agenda, I think. I'll, uh, I'll give you a, an introduction of what is core a, a bit after, because I have it, we have a bit where we talk about core. So I'll, I'll save it for that. But it's core is UK if you want to go have a visit. So this is the agenda, what we're going to do today. I'm going to give you a little introduction of what are these models from like more of a technical try to explain how it works, because it's always good to have a bit of a knowledge of how these things works in the background. And then I'm going to tell you a tiny bit of what the OU is doing about it. And then I move on what my team is doing about it. That is really exciting. And then we move to a little game to just break the ice. And then we hopefully will have like about half an hour of questions at the end to spend on, uh, on just whatever you want to ask about this topic. So yes, just to give you a, a starting point for this is we are talking in the world of artificial intelligence. This world is massive, is wide. There's many different topics, many different subjects that you can explore into artificial intelligence. What we're looking here is about generative models, and if you want to make it really simple, a generative model is a black box where you provide it a lot of examples, and then you provide it some instructions, a prompt. And then on the other side, this box will generate you a new object based on your instructions and the example you send it. So this applies to many different plays. The one that we're looking here are more like the image generation one, they're called diffusion model because of the way they interpret the image and they store them inside the model. So in, at some point, you need to convert them into numbers because that's how a computer will work with it. So that's diffusion is about the fact that how these numbers are generated. On the other side, the other one that are really interesting are the large language models. There's uh, different types, but all the big players at the moment are working on them. There's OpenAI, ChatGPT. Most of you probably already heard it if you're here. And uh, there's also the one from Facebook, Llama, and there's also the one from Google, it's called Google Bard. They, they're all kind of in the same group. They're all different. And some of them, we know more about them. Some of them are more like corporate and don't tell us too much. But you know, in general, they all work in the same way. They train on a lot of text and they move on towards a result with a prompt. Uh, this is just a little, little introduction of what we're talking about. The world is massive and is expanding ever so so much. I think this may, makes me a bit sick, so I'm gonna change it quickly. Um, it's a it's a big universe. There's so many things to look. So I'll just give you a really quick scratch the surface point. But if you're interested more, there's way more to read than to look into this kind of uh, field. So moving into the uh, large language models. So the basic abstraction of a large language model is exactly like your phone autocomplete. So you, the examples you send to your phone autocomplete are the text that you sent before, the text you sent previously. And what it does, the autocomplete, it predicts what is your next word. 
And sometimes it's quite accurate, isn't it? So it gives you the most probable word you're going to use in your sentence. This is the same for large language models. They approach the same problem in the same way. They try to predict what's next. So they pick the most probable word. In reality, they don't pick the most probable word. They pick a set of the most probable words. And then they use different logic to choose which one is the best suited. And there's a bit always a random to just give it a bit more creativity. In fact, in uh, especially on OpenAI, the ChatGPT one, you can set the temperature. So you can make it go in a really small, most probable set that give the answer is really accurate, but also repetitive. Because if you think about it, the most probable terms after a while, they start to repeat themselves because some words tends to always go together, right? And on the other side, you have, uh, when you instead increase the temperature, you make it a big uh, result set, it becomes really creative. So it may be less accurate, it may becomes more imaginative, but you have more chances to generate some creative text. So in uh, ChatGPT, you can set this uh, parameter and you can increase or reduce the amount of temperature to just exactly monitor this in, I mean, in, a, in a really simplistic way. That's how it works. When we're talking about large, we're talking about massive amount of data. So the examples I was saying about are really big. In general, they say it's trained all over the, on all the internet, okay? So it's all the data that is on the internet. This graph that you see here, this colorful graph is uh, coming from, I think, from something from three, four years ago already. And this was the description of the data set used to train, I think, GPT-2 or 2.5. And the purple box that you see there is Wikipedia. So if you imagine Wikipedia being all the human knowledge, that's the little small proportion of what is the content inside uh, the data set they used to train. So they huge, there's a, a huge amount of text. And this is one of the winning factor of this large language model that they are trained with so much text that when they try to predict new text, that's the place where they're really good because they know they have a lot of examples to take to take information for. So why are these models popular? Well, there's quite a lot of theories why they're becoming so popular. They've been around for a long time, but uh, this moment now they are like, everybody's talking about them. Uh, I guess that you're here also because everybody's talking about them. So what's happening is that there have been a couple of decisions in the recent time that made it like turn the corner and become public for everybody. So first thing is that OpenAI added an additional model on top of these big large language models. He added an additional machine learning tool that was trained on human uh, data that they ranked responses from uh, uh, ChatGPT. So they were saying, this response is really good. This response doesn't make any sense. Thanks to this machine learning model, they're now able to predict the quality of the answers. So by doing that, they're able to remove all the answers that are really bad. So, you know, even if the model is not perfect, they are able to exclude all the, th all the answers that are really bad, don't show them, but only show the one that are really good. So they are able to select always the one that, even if not the best, they are at least okay to show. And that kind of improved a lot the perception of the quality of this model. And then the other massive change that happened, uh, I think last year before Christmas, was that ChatGPT was made public and publicly accessible to everybody. This means that from a tool that was uh, enabling only programmers or like technical people to use, it became something that everybody could use. And that kind of showed the potential. And because the tool was really good, that kind of showed the potential and now everybody is using it everywhere. So um, I put a cheeky uh, chart here. This is the famous chart about the hype curve. I can't tell you where we are and I can't tell you if you're gonna follow this, but many technological trends follow this kind of uh, this kind of curve. Some trends of these like span over like 10 years. Some of them go around this in like two weeks. We are somewhere on this curve. I can't tell you where because there's so much things happening, but uh, I can tell you that this is mostly the how technology works. So we were we will be somewhere here. I'm not really sure where. Regarding images instead, we have uh, the same concept, but applied to images. So what is the difference is that instead of converting text into numbers, this time they convert pixels into numbers. 
And what it means, it means that it generates noise. So what you see here, the diffusion means is that if you show you a picture of a bird, the system will digest it by converting it into a specific type of noise. So by learning how to generate this noise, you also learn how to do the reverse mechanism to generate the back. That is quite difficult to get as a concept, but I'll show you the next video that I made. That is a video based on a prompt, a really simple prompt that is a Lego, a Lego duck in a lake. This is, was the prompt. And this is an image generation based on 50 iterations. So every time, every single pixel, based on the context, the single pixel is decided if it needs to be a duck, a lake, or a Lego piece. So by, based on this, is able then to go over and over it many times until the image stabilizes into something that matches the prompt. So this is 50 iterations. You can see the video here. And you can see how it starts really random, really noisy, but then it slowly converge to become a Lego duck that slowly becomes made of Lego pieces. And then the, if you can see at the end, the changes are really subtle because the final refinements are only into the little bit of Lego pieces to kind of make it really nice and square. And that's more or less the final result. Yes, you see, for example, the eye change at the end to be square because there's no round, rounds in uh, Lego. So like every time is a single pixel, predict the next pixel based on the context and based on the prompt. So this is more or less these two, mo these two big models that are really popular now. We are really excited about this. And the next part is about what are we doing at the OU with these kind of models? So I'm part uh, the creator with David Pride, also of the Knowledge Makers. There is a group that connects academics and makers. And we think that both of them share quite a lot of things, like a passion to doing things, but they usually come from different perspectives. So we will, what we would like is to connect these two, these two groups and make them talk to each other, because I think there's a lot that can come out. And in fact, in the last years, a lot came out of this. We had quite a lot of success stories. One of these stories was Professor John Domang coming to us and say, why don't we do a workshop about generative AI and all of these big processes? We did last uh, February and we had 150 people, if no more, coming both uh, live then and uh, virtually. And together with this, we also asked, okay, what are people doing uh, about this at the Open University? And I think we got across all the faculties, at least 30 different people independently were working on these kind of tools and making things about it. So this was a great moment for us to connect and show them. And if you go to the website, you can see the full uh, presentation that we made and you can see how amazing things people are doing. Is now, it, this was in February. And as you know, the speed of this kind of stuff is quite crazy. So some stuff might be a bit obsolete, but you know, it's, uh, it's really exciting how to see so many people working on the same technology. One, uh, I, I'll show you a couple of examples of what people are working on. So one of them is this kind of like futuristic view of what the open university could be in the future using AI. Some of these things are already there. Like there's some uh, student assessment prediction already set up. And there are some other stuff that are work that are, that are being worked on. There's something about a model creator, but uh, in general, there are different agents that powered by artificial intelligence that can help do you run what we do. So there are bits that digital assistant that can help the students help them with a digital assistant to help them study and give them feedback on what they're doing together with a course creator where the, this has been trialed, the course creator has been trialed in the last months. I think the project is finishing now where basically the module creator can have a, a chat uh, interface where they can help them creating text. And the most important part is contextualized text. So giving a, a different version of the text for different aspects. So you can use the same text in different, uh, in different places. And with the large language models, you can like shape it in the way you want it. And like, you know, it saves time on rewriting the same text with different words. You can use that as a starting point. And then of course, there are other aspects as well where we are discovering. It's as funny here that, for example, it's a dream machine. I'm, uh, I'm still not sure what it is, but uh, you know, this, these things are happening and there's, uh, there's plenty of things happening. And also on the image part, there's um, 
there's a lot of stuff happening on especially enabling idea generation. So there's a lot of uh, artificial image generation that can help them push like the people, the students on how they can generate ideas. This is a perfect uh, example for using images. And you can see some examples here, but uh, I know that for example, the design models are using these for uh, uh, making exercise about idea generation. So you don't have like the blank page panic. You start from something that already exists and then that could cause you to move and you know move your creative process. Uh, the last part, is about the community of practice that we created after that meeting that Michelle is leading. And I think Michelle, you can join and do the next two slides. Maybe. So anyway, uh, I don't know if Michelle can join, but uh, we'll... Uh... I'm here, it's just requiring a few skills that okay, I don't seem to have. Um, and for some reason, I don't know why it's not. Let me swap to that camera. There we go. Too many cameras, I think. Sorry. Apologies for that. So so it's really exciting time for the Open University. It's a really exciting time for the sector. And by sector, I mean other higher education institutions, not just around the England, but around the United Kingdom, around the world. And there's so much to learn and there's so much to see and lots of people doing lots of really interesting things. So Within the OU, as Matteo has shown you, we have experts already in artificial intelligence. And these experts have been doing a lot of really cool work for a long time so that we can better support you to improve your uh, student experience and your study experience and hopefully get the results that you want. We have been running, as Matteo alluded to, a set of test and learn projects, but more recently we've been looking specifically at generative AI and over 100 ideas have been produced about how we can move this work forward. We are very keen, for example, to in start building um, generative AI into curriculum. So that means that when you leave the Open University, we, don't, we want you to not only leave with your subject specialism, but also with generative AI skills. Now, some of you will be studying computer Computing, so it makes perfect sense that you'll have some of those generative AI skills. But some of you might be studying something like, you know, I was a student in STEM and I studied um, mental health science. So you might, I might think, well, what's the use of this for me? But actually, there are already jobs being advertised that want generative AI skills. Now, you might have heard a little bit about prompt writing and prompt engineers, but actually that's going to be a passing phase. What we what what employment really needs are people who can identify problems, articulate problems, and generative AI can then help you find solutions to those problems. And I think it's really important that we as an institution help upskill you in what is going to be the future with generative AI in your careers. So we're looking at all of those ways that we can build generative AI into your learning and building it into your skill set so that you're prepared for the future for careers. Uh, Matteo talked about the Knowledge Makers event that was run in STEM and uh, the link, I believe, Matteo, you are going to share that so people can have a look at that, right? Yes, you're nodding. Yes. And then we have four faculties. You might only know about STEM, but we do have four faculties at the Open University. And all of the faculties have staff who are experts in assessment. And within that, we are testing all of our assessments. So we're looking at, and, and because we get this question a lot, is, is around, well, what are you gonna do about it to, to ensure that the OU degree is, is still a great one? And so all of the faculties have already for a while now been looking at, okay, how can we use generative AI to improve the assessment, to make it more authentic, to make it more real life, to actually take it beyond the, you know, kind of the boring type of assessment that you might be thinking, oh God, not another one of these again. So we're really playing with assessment to see how we can make it exciting, to see how we can make it relate to your workplace, relate to your work ambitions, how we can relate it to what you are studying. And also uh, exciting, a personal learning assistant. I mean, if you think of generative AI as having hundreds of personal assistants, so you can get, uh, you know, I, I had a dyslexic student say to me, I use generative AI to sense check what I've written. Or we, we have other students saying, oh, I've got blank page syndrome. I don't know where to start. What we would ask you and say to you is that you, you have actually assigned a student agreement when you started at the Open University. And in that student agreement, you've said you will not um, 
transfer, I think is the word in the agreement, open university materials. So it's not okay to take a whole block of open university material and drop it into a commercial generative AI tool like ChatGPT or Bard or Llama. What you can do though, however, is help it go from that blank page syndrome going, well, this is what I want to think about it. This is how I want it to be, but I'm not quite sure. So you can get it to, to be a study buddy. Or I, I know students who were taking exams who were using it to test. Um, what I will say, and I and I uh, think you know, Mateo's alluded to, and many of you will be aware of, is that there's an awful lot of creative license when it comes to generative AI commercial tools. So, what it produces is not necessarily going to be accurate. And we've been doing some testing with citations, for example. So you might say, okay, I'm going to reference it. Or you might say, you might even ask it to write you a piece with references. Beware, more than 70% of those references are likely to be false. So the author might look great, the topic, the subject, the, the title might look great, the journal is probably exists or it might not exist. Um, there are, you know, the dates look great, the length are great. So it all looks like a real citation, but unless you've actually gone and looked at that article, you don't know it's real. So you've got to be very careful. And, um, you know, these hallucinations that generative AI produces absolutely are real. So are we, are you probably seen in the in the news, there was a case in Australia, a legal case where a professor said, I was named as uh, being arrested for uh, and indicted for this particular thing. I was the whistleblower on it. But ChatGPT said I was the person responsible for it. So you've got to be really careful what comes out. So you need to be even more critically aware if you are going to use it. It's just like if you ask, you know, Mateo or me to write an assignment for you, you can't take it for granted that what we're writing is correct or accurate. We don't know necessarily. It might sound great, but make sure that you're actually testing for accuracy and that what you're putting forward is all your own work. So we do have academic conduct and misconduct policies. Generative AI falls into that. At the end of the day, submit your own work. If you are going to use a tool, then absolutely reference it and, and make it very clear that what you have used in where, but we are encouraging students to explore and learn. You're going to need these skills for the future. And we're doing a lot of research and scholarship activity across the university. Next slide, Mateo. So what has the university done so far? Well, we set up a task and finish group to focus specifically on learning, teaching and assessment. And we had more than 40 staff who are experts in generative AI or experts learning and teaching and assessment. We also have people from the student support team and from people who to make sure that you get your marks at the end of the day so that you can go on to the next module. We came together and we've been running co-creation workshops, we, which means that we're working together. There's no one author, it's group authorship and ownership. We've published a statement on the website. There's a link in the slide, but um, I can, I don't know, I'll put it in, ask Katrina maybe to put it in the chat somewhere so that you can go to that link. We have a set of enabling principles, which are bold and open and inclusive because we absolutely want to move forward with generative AI as an institution. We are planning more detailed staff and student guidance. So there's a little bit of guidance on the website, but there's more in progress. And in the autumn, we're putting a survey out to students asking you how you are using it, because we want to know as well. And I think that's it from me, Matteo. All right. Thank you very much. As a thank you for, the, for this uh, overview on, uh, on the OU uh, status, because that's uh, your best suited to, to talk about this than me, definitely. <laughs> Thanks, Matteo. And uh, yes, then, so I think uh, Michelle already spoke about the opportunities. There's uh, so many opportunities about using these. These are the one from the uh, open university point of view, but uh, this, like, you know, if when you talk about opportunities on a technology like this, there's so many things. I think what uh, what is it, what we also need to raise here, and this is a one single slide that probably will need uh, about three different as the experts to untangle all of these problems. But uh, what I want to say is just that we need to be aware. So first of all, I saw so many people online using uh, the chat GPT and all these models as if they are telling them the future or is them, if they're telling them uh, what to do next. And that is just the place where you would never get it right. Like, it might, I mean, it's a 50-50 chance. It's, uh, it's the internet. I think uh, 
most of us here now have been using the internet for a while and we shouldn't trust the internet on, on its own. I think everything needs to be approached with a critical thinking, as Michelle was saying. And uh, we also cannot rely too much on these kind of things on their own because they, they have their own limits. So we need to be aware of the limits and we need to use them without making them take over and just you know lazily rely on something like that. And uh, one, uh, one interesting thing I, I want to say uh, is uh, about reproducibility, because it's, it's not too much mentioned usually that uh, using these models is great. And it improved a lot of things that we are doing are improved using these models because they are like the power behind them is really big. But uh, it, it make it more difficult to then like create reproducibility into experiments. So if you're using this tool into your experiments, uh, just to give you a context, reproducibility means if I write an experiment, I would like anybody else reading my experiment and be able to reproduce exactly the same results. Otherwise, what I, what I write is meaningless, right? Because it's, it's not reproducible. So if you add one of these tools, you start to face a challenge because these tools kind of have this kind of randomicity to try to suggest you different things. So the relying over these tools sometimes might take as a step away from reproducibility, there's always been a big problem in science. So I think we need to be careful on approaching this and always try to put measure in place to ensure that the reproducibility doesn't go away. Because if we lose that, then like science just take a step backward and there's already a lot of uh, issues of these, uh, these kind of things happening. The big elephant in the room that I haven't mentioned already is about hallucinations. So Michelle already uh, said it before, there is a lot of hallucinations that are happening. It's a, you know, it's artificial intelligence. I explained you how it works. So you can expect that that kind of most probable suggestion, it doesn't mean that it's the right one. It just means that in that place, it fits okay, it fits well. So we did something in my team on this. I mean, of course, we, we haven't solved the problem, but we are working on it. And we, are, we think we have some good ideas. So let's start by looking at this wonderful biography for me, this uh, really uh, emeritus professor that is Jeffrey Bakker. If you read it, this looks perfectly reasonable. You look at it and you kind of get impressed about the amazing work that this guy did on uh, whatever innovative stochastic methods or whatever it is. And look at the citation. The citation as well look all fairly correct. The reality is that all of the, what you see in this slide, is all artificially generated. This person doesn't exist. I, I mean, you could probably guess it because his brain is actually, I think, bigger than the average face, but you know, it's still kind of a realistic face. And the, all the citations that you see there, all the papers there are all not real. None of these papers exist. So this was how it was generated. It was a, a prompt, a really relatively simple prompt. And the picture was picked up from one of these websites where it generates pictures that are like from non-human pictures. It's uh, it's all like, you know, really reasonable, but it's not, it's not true. It's just uh, reasonable, it's, it's good looking. And it's uh, we tend to trust it because it's, you know, it's well-written and good looking. So what we try to do in core is try to, ap to approach this from a different perspective. So core, my, major uh, project is uh, the world's largest aggregator uh, of open access papers. So me and my team work on, uh, on this project. And what happened is when a researcher anywhere in the world submits a paper into their university library, and if you write a paper, you're usually required to submit a paper into your library. In core, we collect all these papers from around the world, and then we make them more visible, more discoverable for everybody, for the community to search. So we have API, we have a search engine on top of it, we have a data set, and we offer services based on this huge amount of open access papers. So this is good research. It, we have about 260 to 300 million papers that are available for people to search. 300 million paper, by the way, compared to what uh, GPT is trained on is uh, 1%, because, um, actually 001% or something, because they're trained on billion of, pay, of uh, text files, okay? So it's not as much, but it's 300 million papers that are good research papers. So on the other side, we have these GPT models. 
And this is a wonderful picture that uh, someone on Twitter uh, shared, where you could see that they work really well, but there is a black box. There is a, a certain bit that is magic. So you enter your prompt, you control that, you can write that. You then have some ways of kind of moving that prompt into the machine. But then there is a bit of magic that is relatively not controllable. And then it produces an output. So how do we trust this output? Because that's that part is still like, it's a bit black magic, really. It's not, it's, it's not visible by humans what's happening there. I mean, first of all, because it's incredibly uh, complex because of the size of it. But also there's, there's um, the model, once it's produced, it's, it's a kind of opaque. It doesn't have visibility of what, what's happening there. So what we're trying to do here, we say, okay, this is what it is. It's really good for generating text. Why don't we plug the 300 million of papers of core and we force, we ask strictly the GPT models to use the paper from core. This will give us answers that look better. So we are uh, releasing this as a parallel to our search, to a different experience to the search. And we are offering something with results that looks like this. So when you ask a question, you will get a nicely written answer that is probably better than a normal search results. And then together with that, you will have citations and the citations will point to real papers. So we don't see this as something where you look at it and you know, you know everything about it and you go away. We see these as the first stepping stone for our research part to look at this and say, okay, now I know a bit more. What do I go next? What, what papers should I read to know what, what's more there? And this is the idea of what we're trying to, to make in course. So it's, it's more a philosophical standing in a way, and it's also a way of using these GPT tools. We are not uh, stopping here. We are using these uh, language tools also in different places. We're looking into using them for providing better paper recommendations or uh, for uh, for improving many other areas because they're, re they're really powerful. So I think if if we control them in, a, in the right way, if they're used in the right way, there could be really a, a good potential in moving us forward in general. Um, so like we're getting towards the end, there's a, a couple of things I wanted to mention. I'll go really quick. So uh, there's a, a few things that are, I haven't mentioned yet because of course, space and time especially about uh, um, AI by agent. So another thing that is evolving now is that you have different artificial intelligence models running for different things. And then if you have another AI that can connect to all of them, then you have like, you know, you take a step further into, into the intelligence. So some people started playing with this and started creating new models. So there's one that is called baby GPT because he has kind of the mentality of a baby. And then, of course, a couple of weeks later, because this field moves as fast as possible, someone was, OK, I made one better, so I'm going to call it toddler GPT. So there's an evolution there of trying to make something of giving tools to this AI to interact with each other. And I think there's a good potential there. There's good potential also in using different objects. There is no text of images. There's movies and music that are going really far ahead. Now people can generate big clips or movies directly using AI. And also the other thing that is interesting is lightweight models. So models that don't need to run on, on the big computers, they may be less powerful, they can run on small computers, for example, your phone, or they can run on, um, on small machines. And this is a massive potential because then if you have this kind of level of text generation, these little items that we have into our house, maybe they can start to speak more like us. Right, so we don't need to understand the machines more, but the machine that speak more like us, that, that would be really great, really exciting. Um, so more or less, I said, I gave you what, uh, what I know and what we're doing. I think the next step, there's some links here. I'm gonna share all the slides later so that we can have, uh, you can have all of these and then you can click on the links. The next step, I think it's uh, moving to the game. And then after the game, we go to the questions. That's uh, the, the part that is actually the Ask the Expert. So this game is about locating different, uh, I'll leave this for a bit so that um, also Katrina, maybe you can, uh, you can help me out. Um, so we are I'm gonna show you two different generation. One written by a human, or at least I hope is a human. I found it on the internet, so I, let's hope that is correct. And the other one is written by AI. 
or in the images is the same. One image is human generated, one is computer generated, which one is which? It's a really simple game, but there are, I think, quite a lot of insights that we can look into this. So, Katrina, are we ready? Should we go to the next? We're ready. I've opened the poll on VVAX. I popped the link in the chat, both on Facebook and YouTube. Um, so folks want to head there and then select A or B. So if you want to put the, uh, there we go, put that back so, up. Yes. So first one that we have here, it's a movie review. So how do we feel about movie reviews generated by AI? This one is, this, this is like a, a hint that I can give you. It's generated from the, the human one is coming from The Guardian. Both of them ranked the, pay, the, the movie five stars, is Avengers Endgame. I just wanted a super popular movie just to keep it uh, really well known. So which one is which? I, I, uh, I have kind of a passion to, to play in this game on my own because there's quite a few things that you can recognize for AI. They're not always true, but they kind of help. So for example, there's things like, they usually an introduction and, um, and a conclusion on AI. Like humans sometimes don't write like that. Or some people say, for example, that there is a use of uh, difficult words that uh, a human won't use. But that thing, watch out, because they think of difficult words applies. But if you're a journalist writing for The Guardian, it applies a bit less. So it maybe it doesn't apply too much here because both of them here are using quite you know complex words relatively. It's not rel simple English. So which one is which? That's the question. So do we have um, enough thoughts? What do you think, Katrina? Oh, well, first it was neck and neck. Right now, answer A is leading the way with about 65% of the vote, but they keep going up and down. You can tell a lot of people are scratching their heads. Oh, that's exciting. Leading this. So should we give uh, another 30 seconds and then we close it? Yeah, that's fine. All right. So what's what's yours, Casino? You know, what's yours? Well, I think that um, when it comes to movie reviews, you're often really limited on space. Um, so my inclination, without reading it word for word, is B. Um, but um, it looks like we've got some folks, um, particularly on YouTube, who are working in this area. Um, Carlos, for instance, this is exactly the job I'm doing within company right now, assesses the right answer. So we have some experts. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. They're probably more experts than me. That's uh, embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. I think we can move to the, to the answer. So we can do a bit more. So this is the answer. The first one was from The Guardian. I think I the peak of the review was quite tricky because it's um, it's quite distracting, isn't it? Like the journalist there was using a really, um, he had his own flair to the text, right? So when you compare it to another from, uh, from GPT, that's a difficult thing because you don't know who's the journalist. Maybe if I was telling you who was the journalist, and if you could read a couple more, you could guess it faster. But like this, it was really difficult. I think this one is a, I, I knew it, so it's okay. And also another thing that you could check is they usually tend to put a conclusion. There's always a conclusion there. The kind of the AI generated one, there's always a conclusion while humans tend to not always write that. But it's something that they tell you at school to write a conclusion. So, you know, it's not impossible. So next one up, it's images. Ready for the next one, Katrina? Yeah. Go. So I think this one is fast. So I'll keep this like quick because I think this one is, I didn't do a good job probably here. So you can probably recognize it quite quickly, but food, focus, food photos made by AI, it's one of my passion. <laughs> I don't know why I love to look at them and try to find why they're wrong or why they're right. So in this case, it's a tiramisu. And uh, I usually tend to look at weird things that shouldn't be there. Or I tend to look at like, camera effects that are weirdly there, but they shouldn't. So, yeah, but then like- And you'd I, want I, to focus on the tiramisu in this picture rather than a blurry picture. Yeah, I mean, 
Yes. What? Uh, what's yours? What do you think? I think A is the human picture. Okay, so you need to vote B on the. On mm -hmm. the what? Uh, how is it going on there? I think this one is probably easy, so I would say. Yeah, B B is leading right now. All right. So let's uh, let's go quick because this one I think is too easy. Let's move on. <laughs> B was the right one. That's correct. It was a. Uh, Food pictures in a restaurant. The other one was from Unsplash. However, like the filters applied to the picture to make it look more appealing, because uh, um, the image generation cannot reproduce the kind of filter. Sometimes it could be this misleading. This one was relatively easy, but it's not always like that. Um, I think because we don't have too much time, I think uh, I skip. Uh, I move to. I do another image and another one. That are, I'll skip this one and maybe send you this later. I'll uh, I'll do this one. So this one is an, an oil painting portrait in a which number canvas. is that, Matteo? Sorry, you know which question? Oh ah, yeah, it's uh, skip one. Skip one. Okay. It's not the paper; it's the portrait. Sorry, I yes, I should yep. have said that. That's all right. Well, these image ones are good because you really got to think as to what would AI think the focus should be. Yes, and uh, I mean, because I know it, I feel I'm unbiased, so I can recognize all the mistakes. But if you take these outside of the context, sometimes it's not that easy, especially on a painting where the artist might have put his own flair to it. So it's... Uh, it's complicated. If it's a photo, the, sometimes it's easier, but on paintings, it's a bit more difficult. Uh, oh, yes. A lot of people are jumping on uh, A being the AI one. And I think I agree. Those eyes are a bit funny. Oh my God, yes. That one eye is really scary, isn't it? <laughs> they look like they're in two different places on her head, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, I think that went wrong, I think, on the image generation. But you see, it's because it's because of how it's generated. Both of the eyes, if you take them on their own, are correct. But then they are not able, it's not able to recognize, okay, how do I put the two eyes that are kind of similar together? Instead, they put two different eyes. So it's uh, it's true, it's A. I mean, it's uh, if this one is uh, A. And then I think, um, what do you think? Do, can we do another one? Katrina, yeah, let's do one more, I think. Yeah. All right, and then I'll do I'll do this one because I like this one. So that's the ALI5. So uh, this one is about, uh, there's a subreddit on Reddit that is explain me like I am five. So it's a place where people can ask questions and the experts or anybody can need to answer, but they need to answer as if the person asking is a five-year-old. So in theory, they need to simplify the knowledge so much that then it can be understood both for a five-year-old. Five year old. I don't think they do it quite right. Like sometimes, you know, it's still quite complex, the answers, but it's getting there. So I, I got an AI to tell me that, and then I got a real answer from Reddit. The funny part of this is that they are different. Like the answer they give are completely different. They tell you two different stuff. So. If you know which one is correct, you can guess it immediately. Otherwise, you need to base it on different informations, maybe. So any opinion, maybe, Katrina? Um, well, we've got about a dozen responses right now, and it is neck and neck, 50% and 50%. So I reckon if we just give people Couple seconds of silence so they can read. A few people said it's hard to focus on the oh, sorry. text. No, no, it's all right. We'll give them give them a moment to read. I'll have a drink. Well, we are starting to see a bit of a lead uh, winner here.
Oh, some people are changing their minds. Oh. <laughs> right. Well, we've had about 35 answers come in now, and it's about 60% of people say A is the AI generated answer. Are they right? They are. Well done. Because the answer, the the one that is uh, the real one is uh, a, a is the very real one. B is the robot. Uh, I think. Uh, so they were wrong. So yes, the, the real the one the oh. went wrong. That's exciting, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. I think it the the trick here is that what is interesting is that I'm forcing the text generation to follow certain rules. So by forcing it to be more, explain me like a five-year-old, it kind of forces it to kind of change the structure. So things that you recognize in other places, you won't get it. By the way, the answer here is, I think the answer from the, the correct answer is the A one. And I don't think that there's a computer measuring this, the level of the fuel, as, as I understand it. I'm not an engineer, but I think it's, uh, that the B answer is the is not right, but maybe some experts in the audience could tell us better about it. Uh, yes, I think uh, is uh, it's really exciting, and there's some things where the tool can do better, and some things that can do worse. So, like uh, I was trying here to give you a couple of examples of things where it's difficult to guess right or wrong, and of course, like I did this like in a quick job you could improve the prompting to make it a bit better, but also like there's always a limit. You're always arrived to a place where you cannot do more because that's, you know, it's still automatically generated. I think there's a, there's a limit, especially when you do artistic things. Like if you don't know, probably you might get tricked sometimes, but not always, there's always an issue. Um, I feel we should stop with the quiz because otherwise we run out of time. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, let's take some questions. We can uh, we can share the, the slides later and then people can play it, can check them on, the, on their own if they can guess the others. Sure, yeah, I will. Um, what I'll do is I'll pop my team's mailbox in the chat. So send an email to stem-communications at open.ac.uk and we can go ahead and email you over a copy of Mateo's presentation. So give me one second to type that in. And right, so start Stop sharing. for questions in the chat, everyone. And um, we can, I'll ask them of Matteo. Um, I do have one though, and you touched on it a little bit earlier. What are some really obvious signs that text has been generated by AI? Uh, it, I mean, it's a bit of an art at the moment. There's some people that are really good and some people that are less good. As I understand it, there are uh, things like, it's um, if you see the average things, like uh, the introduction is always a, a clear structure, while if someone, a human is writing, maybe the structure is not always the same. There's uh, the type of words. Uh, I talked with someone, the, an assistant lecturer that was doing an assessment and he was, he recognized that some of the words used there would be like a student wouldn't use the word because the words were clearly something, you know, that common language wouldn't use. So this kind of stuff are usually indicators. And then it depends, it varies. Like it usually tends to be quite void. I don't know how to explain it, but especially when you ask uh, generic questions, when then you look at it a bit further after the first reading, the first reading is always like, yes, that's really good. But when you look at it the second time, most of the time, the concepts are a bit lost. Like sometimes there's some kind of, the same concept repeated in different sentences. So there's always a feel that something is like, it's like, it's like someone like if you're human would write a, a sentence, but without, like without putting too much thought into it, just repeating the same message all over again. That's the kind of thing. While a human would probably add 
add a bit more to it. You you could feel that. I, I, it's difficult to to explain really. Sometimes it'll be really obvious, I yeah. suppose, on on how much information you gave um, yeah. chat to begin with. So if you put in a really specific question, it probably gives you um, a much specific answer, which will be harder to tell um, from a human written answer, I suppose. Yes, it's uh, it, it depends. It depends a lot on the context as well. Like, but uh, especially on things that you know. If you ask a question, you recognize. You can easily recognize it. If you ask something that you don't know, it's more difficult because you don't have that kind of knowledge to understand if there's any meaning behind it or not. Yeah. Um. So I've got a question on OU research. I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this. If not, Rachel, we will hold on for the question for our next event on generative AI, which will be held in September. But um, Rachel's asked, is the OU doing any research into how to reduce bias in AI, which can be caused by a biased training data set? Oh, Michelle knows that one, brilliant. Welcome the, back. The short answer is yes. It is one of the key priorities for the university because we are, absolutely aware that the canon or all of the materials from which generative AI works are a biased set and we are very keen as an institution to incorporate uh, considering that bias from generative AI into any new curriculum we are developing and we are also reviewing existing curriculum if any of it has been produced or used or is using generative AI so 100% we are doing work in the space it's very important to us. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so Matteo, this is this is one for you. Do you think AI will make humans will make humans to think less and completely rely on what the tool produces without a proper check, etc.? How can we prevent this from happening? Well, it's an in theory question. Well, it's like yeah, a million dollar question, really. But uh, <laughs> I mean, for me, I'm. Um, I'm on the skeptical side of this. So I think we're not there yet by by a long while. So there's uh, the, th the things that it generates are always is still like, uh, I mean, where if you do it for citations, for example, for core, we've done that. 75% of the time, the answer you get, the citations you get are all wrong. So there's no, you can't trust it. So what uh, I'm predicting, if I can't predict, I mean, I've probably got nothing about it but uh, is that it's really good for generating spam text, like really bad basic text, like the one that you see on like the scam websites and things like that. Probably gonna get flooded by that. We're gonna have so much rubbish content coming from that. But the things that are real and important, I think that there will be a bit of reliance on it, but I don't think that we are at the stage where it will take over. So I think humans will still, unfortunately, we, we cannot be replaced yet. <laughs> Fortunately, I think. Good. We cannot keep our jobs for a little bit longer. Did you have something you wanted to add? It's two things. One is that people ask, will my job be replaced by AI? And the answer is no, but your job will be replaced by someone who has generative AI skills. So you, you will need the skills. And then I would like to invite people to think about the human intelligence and life experience aspect that these tools do not have. So if you ask, and this is an age old scenario, a generative AI or any kind of AI, uh, there are a hundred birds on a fence, one gets shot, how many are left? Well, we all say none because we know that they all fly away, but the AI will say there are 99 left. So we still need that human thinking and we're always going to need that human element coming into these things, but use it for the mundane tasks and yet let your brain do the creative tasks. So, um, right, so Alicia wants to know, do you think AI will make human, oh, sorry, I already read that one, Dr. Carl. Uh, how far are we from being able to curate the image database that the Gen AI pulls from? For example, can I tell it to use my own images and sources that have ethical copyright in place? That's a big, big issue. There's a many. Uh, there's a, quite a lot of debate about this. So 
the the thing the company are doing to get to gather these images is quite shady to be honest and uh, it feels like some of these things is like um um a lawyer problem that is waiting to happen somewhere so is at the moment it's quite uh, difficult to to say like there's no accuration like that there are there are ethical ai work happening where they source the images in an ethical way so they ask permission or they take images they have licensing correct but the the big model you see now they are keeping that kind of secret because there's potential problem there there's uh, many ethical issues uh, impacting that and i think they're kind of trying to avoid it but this conversation will need to come up again and again and i think we are on a low uh, is a lawsuit way to happen where like you know somewhere some rules needs to be set up i think europe is working on creating a bit a bit of a framework on this so they're going to create some registration but then like i think governments have, have this double way where they don't want to stop progress but they do also don't want to kind of uh, have ethical problems so like it depends what kind of government you are sometimes you know you weigh on one side or the other but it's uh it's difficult Absolutely. There are a few comments on YouTube as well about the use of intellectual property rights um, and the fact that things like ChatGPT are pulling things from, from all over the internet without discretion. So, um, Michelle, you might be able to answer a curriculum related one. Um, Chris is studying year one in uh, for his BSc in computing and IT in the software engineering pathway. Um, is there a time frame for when we're adding uh, generative AI into the OU curriculum? So I can say we're already working on this, but I cannot give you a timeline, unfortunately. I would say keep your eyes also open on, uh, on Open Learn. So we are creating short courses that are free to students that are going to go on open learn, as well as looking at that it takes longer time to create things like a module about artificial intelligence, uh, a generative AI. Those things are coming, but in the short term, we'll be producing things on open learn. So keep your eyes open. Brilliant. And I will pop the link to open learn in the chat. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with open learn, it is our free learning platform. All the courses on it are free. Um, I know a bit earlier in the chat, I saw someone mention that they like to brush up on their maths before modules start, and Open Learn is a really good place to find um, some of those resources. And let me just have a look and see if we can answer one more. While you're looking, I'll just say be very careful if you go to Open Learn because you might get stuck there for hours. That's what happens to me. There's so much good content. Someone actually agreed with AI on your birds um, example. Somebody thought, oh, I thought 99 birds left over. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that that's that is absolutely true too. I mean, I was speaking to a chat. Well, I don't know. I was speaking to something the other day, and I thought if this is a person, a chatbot could do it better. So, um, so I suppose why don't we just end with maybe um, both of you sharing your opinion on this? Um, Kelvin asks: Is there not a concern that AI has been? advancing very rapidly in recent months and is already beginning to be embedded in many systems. So I can go first and then Matteo as the technical expert can maybe end. Uh, we have a lady, Baroness um, Martha Lane Fox, who is our chancellor of the Open University. And I like what she said. She said, because we, have, we can't believe the hype and we can't believe the fear, but we can double down on the opportunities and mitigate against the risk. So I think in response to that question, um, we will never know what is and isn't going on the background fully. We will know that there are lots of things that are true and lots of things that are not true. So I would say take the opportunities where it matters for you, um, just like any new technology that's emerging, um, embrace it the way that it works for you to embrace it. That's a great advice. That's a, that's a great answer. I'm not sure I can uh, top it up, but... Uh, um, I think uh, I think in in general, like uh, it's becoming part of what we're doing. Uh, my my feeling is that some of the things that they're now are trying to fit, like it's we're getting now in a place where there's a reduction to GPT, 
So everything that you're doing, everybody's trying to hammer in their way of doing it inside these tools, just to put the label that they're using it. My feeling is that this will kind of like smooth things a bit after a while. So like now everybody's going to get obsessed about it, but then at some point, some things will stick, some things we won't, they won't stick and we will go back to do what we were doing before. So like uh, programming is one of the, the possible things. I hear lots of people using it for uh, programming. I can't use it on my on my job. I just try different times. It doesn't work for me. But you know, there's different uh, aspects. I feel like uh, we just need to wait and see and try things. I mean, that's the exciting part. Yeah, and marketing the marketing profession and, and advertising they're using it fully already. So I think it just depends on your context. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, Michelle, Matteo, thank you both so much for joining us today. Um, I hope all of our students and non-students watching uh, learned a little bit more about ChatGPT today. Um, again, Michelle is going to join us with uh, John Demang in September, and we're going to talk a little bit more about ChatGPT GPT, um, at the OU and some of the innovative innovative ways that the OU is uh, using it. So keep an eye on our social media pages for that. We will have uh, a date picked out pretty soon. We got to see when John and Michelle have some free time for us. But thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Matteo. And thank you, STEM students. Fabulous day. Thank you, Katrina. Brilliant hosting. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Brilliant. Thank you.